May I will have you there, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to those of you who are with us here in Washington, D.C. at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And for those of you who are joining us online from different parts of the world, my name is Alper Joshkun. I'm a senior fellow at the Europe Program within the Carnegie Endowment here in uh, Washington, D.C. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you. Uh, we'll be talking today about a paper that my colleague Sinan Ilgen and I co-authored that focuses on the potential trajectory that Turkish foreign policy may take in the event of political change. And uh, we have two very valuable discussants uh, who will be contributing to our uh, debate today. Uh, the first who I'd like to introduce is Ms. Asla Aydin Tashbash, who's a vis visiting scholar right now with the Brookings Institution. Uh, she's also a columnist, a global columnist with the Washington Post and has long years uh, in journalism. Welcome, Asli. It's very good to have you here. You're our Thank neighbor. You. Uh, it's not too far away from where you work. Um, Sinan, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is a scholar with the Carnegie Endowment. I won't go into any further detail than that. And Ms. Humeira Pamuk, who will be our second discussant, is the senior uh, foreign policy correspondent with Reuters. She's covered global affairs all over the world, obviously, on a wide variety of matters. Welcome, Humeira. Thank Thanks for having me. Time to join us as well. Um, there is uh, an interesting um, potential change on the horizon in Turkey. Uh, we have elections coming up in Turkey in 2023. This will be twin elections in the form of both presidential and parliamentary uh, elections. And uh, current polls show that there is a chance that there might be a change, political change in Turkey after two decades of rule under the uh, President Erdogan's uh, AK Party. Um, this is obviously a probability. And what we did with Sinan is to try and analyze what kind of implications a political change in Turkey would have on Turkey's foreign policy trajectory. And the methodology we uh, adopted while trying to do so was um, an interview-based uh, study speaking to the foreign po policy spokespersons of the leading opposition political parties uh, in Turkey. And we tried to compile their views. This is something that we have not come across yet, having been done. And we thought that would be an interesting contribution, given the uh, potential of change in Turkey. We tried to compile their views by focusing both on the uh, areas of overlap, where there may be discrepancies between their uh, approaches. And also, we tried to contrast that, obviously, with the current foreign policy, the general tenets of Turkey's current foreign policy under the uh, AK Parti government. So that is the general background that I wanted to share with you at the outset. Once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. And I'd like to kick off the discussion by giving the floor first to my colleague, Sinan Yurgen, who will set the stage for our discussion. Sinan. Thanks a lot, Alpash, uh, and welcome to you all, um, ones here with us and the ones that are uh, watching this event from many corners of the world. Um, I want to start by uh, saying a few words about that prospect of political change and then switch to the real content of uh, this paper, because this is not a paper that looks at the domestic situation so much. Political change may or may not happen. It's still you know, six or seven months down the road. We'll see what the outcome shall be. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this race is going to be more competitive than uh, past elections. And we say that 
basically uh, on, on looking at uh, the different polls that are out there uh, that show um, decreased support for ruling uh, party and Erdogan, especially on the basis of the economic hardship uh, that uh, Turkey has been experiencing over the past year. That's the main dynamic that has been cannibalizing uh, the uh, vote of the ruling party. And as a result, uh, today the opposition has a, a few names which in, I would say, unprecedented manner, poll better than Erdogan. Uh, the two of them are, you know, the mayors of Istanbul and Ankara, and then the, the chair of uh, the main leading opposition party, CHP, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, and the chairwoman of the other uh, opposition party, Meral Akşener, uh, poll better than Erdogan. The margin with the mayors are higher, so for the time being they look like uh, you know, stronger candidates in that race, and the margins uh, between Erdogan and the two uh, political leaders are smaller. Uh, in the past uh, two months, we've also seen a rebound uh, in uh, Erdogan's popularity, on a number of accounts uh, that also relate to what we shall discuss here, namely uh, the prospects of, uh, the, uh, of uh, foreign policy. Uh, so again, it's still you know, six, seven months down the road. Anything can open, but for the time being, uh, it is uh, an uh, open uh, issue. Now, what we heard, and we'll go a little bit in detail, uh, Alper will walk you through some of our uh, main findings regarding the different uh, bilateral relationships. But if we really want to summarize our main findings about you know, what is it that we heard from the political opposition in terms of how they envision the role of Turkey in the world and what may or may not change compared to today, I would say three things. One, uh, we heard a much stronger emphasis on uh, Turkey's relationship with the West. In other words, uh, almost you know, without an exception, all the parties that we, did, that we talked to uh, have emphasized the need to rejuvenate, to rekindle uh, Turkey's relationship with its main partners in the West, primarily the US, obviously, and Europe. Uh, that's something that you know we heard across the board, uh, and there has been a criticism uh, of the AK Party foreign policy on that note, uh, claiming that over the years uh, the policy that was implemented has created a degree of ambiguity about Turkey's true strategic orientation, leading to questions about you know where is it that Turkey really wants to be whether it's really a Western ally, whether it wants to remain with that status, or whether it wants to create another space for itself that is more independent, equidistant between the West and the non-West. So that's been a criticism. And the answer that we heard is no. We are firm that Turkey's you know, uh, emphasis should be with, in terms of the relations with the West. So that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, and, uh, is that there is going to be uh, also a, um, an emphasis on strengthening fundamental rights, democratic rule, rule of law, and a return to the parliamentary system. Uh, this is also something that you know, is, is shared by all the opposition parties. Uh, they've even come up with a, a program uh, for constitutional change uh, that is based on this premise. And therefore, the argument was uh, the Western vocation uh, will also be strengthened and helped uh, by the reforms at home. And these two will feed on each other. The more Turkey reforms at home, the easier it will be to settle some of the problems that Turkey has faced with its partners in the West. And the third thing in terms of the general principles um, is uh, that uh, the, um, they also want to uh, Reinstitutionalize foreign policy making. One of the criticisms that we heard very often is that in an accelerated pace since the transition to the presidential system, uh, decision making on foreign policy has become over centralized and dependent on the presidential office. And this has not been necessarily good because it, it creates a situation um, of you know, unpredictability. Uh, and it has eroded the role of institutions, primarily the role of the uh, 
uh, foreign ministry in, in decision making. So there has been an expressed desire to reinstitutionalize uh, foreign policy decision making uh, by reestablishing this balance between the presidency and the foreign ministry, firstly. And secondly, by virtue of that, also uh, eliminate or rebalance uh, the, the weights between domestic and foreign. So in other words, the criticism, again, in this instance, has been then over, that over the years, domestic political considerations have weighed on uh, foreign policy dishes, decisions and actions. And that needs to be rebalanced. So yes, in democracies, uh, domestic political considerations should certainly influence foreign, de foreign policy decision making. But this needs a new calibration. We cannot allow purely domestic considerations essentially to impact foreign policy to the extent that we have seen uh, in the past few years. So the reinstitutionalization will also help in redressing that balance between what is domestic and uh, what is uh, foreign uh, policy related. Um, this is perhaps, you know, uh, and, and then of course we went through a number of different areas related that are important for Turkish foreign policy relations with US, NATO, uh, Europe, Syria, East Med, Cyprus, Greece, uh, the rest of the world relations with Russia, China, and so on. But I'll let Alpash uh, speak a few words about that. Thank you, Sinan. Um, I don't intend to summarize all of those elements of the report, but I think given the general framework that Sinan has presented that we've identified based on our, our interviews with the foreign policy representatives, <coughs> it's important to understand how this pattern of change or this general framework that they envisage will have implications in different policy areas. And that is something that we identified where there seemed to be a substantive degree of overlap in the approach that was espoused by the uh, opposition parties. Obviously, there are a very uh, mixed group of political parties, but overall, when you look at the main themes, there were significant overlaps that we were able to identify. And I just want to walk you through, you through some of these just to give a bit of a, a flavor of what we identified and then we'll let our discussants uh, focus on those and then we can take questions from you. One of those, obviously, given the, the general um, outlook that the uh, opposition seemed to be espousing for Turkey in terms of its place in the world, if you will, in other words, its Western vocation, as they express, expressed it to us, that will inevitably, it seems, have implications on the way in which Turkey will uh, strategize under that potential political change, its policy towards its Western allies, and particularly the United States. All of the representatives across the board of the opposition uh, identified the need to rekindle relations with the United States to be an important priority. Uh, they also argued that in parallel to the effort to enhance the rule of law within Turkey, to enhance democratic standards and practices, which they identified as a requirement domestically, which would have implications, obviously, on the way in which Turkey can manage its relationship with the European Union. They also identified the need to enhance relations both with the European Union and individual European nations at large. So the transatlantic relationship and that body politic seem to be an audience to which they wish uh, Turkish foreign policy to be more sensitive towards and to embed itself in. Having made this point, they are also all equally cognizant, and they made this point, that Turkey's relationship with Russia, with countries like China, these are also all important in their own right. They do not envisage Tur Turkey's Western vocation, which they believe should be uh, pronounced stronger, should come at the cost of Turkey's relationship with Russia and China. But I think what they, the change potentially that they are implying is that they will not leave much room for ambiguity as to where Turkey stands in terms of uh, the challenges between uh, these two uh, dynamics, if you will. So it can be expected that under uh, a political change in Turkey, while there are significant problems in the relationship between Turkey and the United States, uh, the atmosphere that uh, may uh, prevail under the rule of the opposition can be more conducive to managing the differences and possibly overcoming them. They did make the point that on a lot of major issues, for example, uh, the, uh, uh, the PYD-YPG relationship that the United States has 
in Syria is a challenge that needs to be resolved. They are firm in their position, similar to that of the current government, that there are important security considerations for Turkey. Hence, that is not an acceptable relationship. The exception was, not surprisingly, the HDP in this regard. So there are different elements uh, among the political parties, but overall the rekindling of relations with the United States, trying to address problems were items they identified. An important component of that, maybe that might naturally come to everyone's mind, is that across the board, they believe that the acquisition of the S-400 air defense system from Russia was a mistake that there is a need to find a, a mutually acceptable solution, a creative solution. They referred to some attempts in that regard that have, not attempts, but ideas, I should say, that were floated by US authorities and in discussions with Turkey. So that seems to be an area where they realize that a step needs to be taken. They have pronounced that they would be willing to do so, but at the same time, they make the point, for example, in the case of uh, Syria, as I mentioned, that they would have expectations from the United States. And these two are not in relation to one another, but they're just different approaches, if you will. Uh, of course, they also stressed, and that also fits into the general framework that they present of how they see Turkey's foreign policy, the need to strengthen Turkey's NATO identity, which again overlaps with uh, their pronouncement of uh, the S-400 acquisition having been a mistake. So there's uh, some continuum, if you will, in, in the logic that they have presented uh, to us. Uh, that's more or less the general framework. There are some policy areas, for example, on relations with Greece, uh, on uh, the uh, Cyprus issue, uh, on the Eastern Mediterranean, where in the Turkish eye, these issues are about politics. They're referred to as national uh, causes where they do not signal there will be uh, any significant change in the way in which they would espouse uh, to follow policy in those areas. Yet they do make the point, and it's evident from the way they present their priorities and the way in which they want to implement and conduct Turkish foreign policy, that in trying to pursue Turkey's interests, even in these long-standing areas, um, they would be in a more non-confrontational uh, posture, uh, they would be open more to diplomacy as the prevailing and chosen method of trying to manage and address uh, these problems. So that is more or less the general uh, span of how they present uh, the way in which they would approach uh, issues on a, a thematic basis. Um, I'll leave it at that, uh, if I may, uh, just to give you, as I said, a little bit of a flavor of um, the individual areas and how we thought they're the general framework they presented my, may uh, reflect on those areas. And uh, turn to Asla, if I may. Uh, Asla, thank you once again for joining us. What I uh, want to ask you, first of all, is um, up until very recently, uh, you were in Turkey. Uh, now you are looking at these issues from uh, a perspective from Washington, DC. Um, there are many um, aspects, obviously, of this potential political change in Turkey that are of interest to the United States. But I'd like to take you a little bit out of that framework as well and ask you first, do you think that uh, the general projection of the priorities or the framework that the opposition in Turkey seems to be espousing for in Turkish foreign policy can actually produce a coherent foreign policy along those lines? How would you see that being received in Turkey's relations with Europe in terms of uh, both the European Union, but also individual European nations. And again, to bring you back to where you are now, where we all are now, the United States, what kind of implications would you see in terms of its uh, impact on relations with the US? Thank you, Alper, and uh, happy to be here with my uh, dear friends in the same panel. Uh, this is a great paper, and it's a very important paper for a number of reasons. Uh, we talk about politics all the time, and in the Twitter age, with fast-paced news cycle, very few of us actually uh, have the ch chance to do the kind of empirical work that Alper and Sinan seem to have done, going out and in interviewing individual members of the opposition parties to tease out to find out and lay out what the opposition foreign policy will be. I think it's very important because uh, there is a lot of information there. Information in terms of opposition's cohesiveness, uh, 
uh, but also in term information about the differences on key issues, whether it's Syria, uh, you know, so, uh, different focus on some of the NATO issues um, in some instances. Not always e, e party and CHP are not always on the same page, or there are different nuances on some critical issues. But of course, you know, uh, I have noticed that uh, a great one of the uh, you know, most important parts of the paper is uh, where opposition parties, for example, talk about normalization of relations with Syria, what their conditions are, what their conditions are not, their outlook on, on a serious Syrian Kurdish politics and to TYPG or, uh, or, or, or the Syrian regime. So these are all very important. And, uh, you know, Alper and Sinan do a bit of an injustice to themselves by saying at the end of the paper, you know, we just spoke to these people. We don't know in the end if these are going to be the final policies. But really, uh, what they have found and laid out is quite representative of the position of these parties. So that's a big uh, important paper to read for those people interested in Turkey stuff. Uh, second point I wanted to make before I come to Turkey, I, as you said, moved to this town a few months ago, and um, it was a very strange experience to talk about Turkish politics in Washington, because when I was in Turkey, until recently, until a couple of months ago, people in Turkey, particularly the, the elite, largely thought the elections are going to result in, the opposition, in an opposition victory. This seemed to be the consensus among uh, the... Uh, in, talking crowd, let's say, the uh, intelligentsia, whereas in this town, the consensus is the other way. You know, there's no election, as Sonar is smiling because he's seen me make this point, but, you know, the, the consensus in this town is that Erdogan will never lose an election, you know, there will not be any difference in all of that. And I think we need a more complicated outlook on this. Uh, it, the, the elections in Turkey are a toss-up, in my view, that's how I explain it. Uh, it's for President Erdogan uh, to win or for the opposition to lose. They can win or lose. And uh, if they come up with, as you, you point out, uh, there are interesting statistics. You point out uh, how some of the potential candidates are polling. Obviously, elections are not going to be decided on foreign policy issues. But if the opposition put forth a, 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 a sort of a, a can maintain their united front and put forth a formidable candidate, they can win or they can also lose. Uh, if they don't do that. So it's uh, interesting, and the reason why we Turks spend a, a ton of time talking about elections and, um, is because I think elections still matter in Turkey. It's another difference that people in this, uh, sometimes I have a hard time explaining to friends and colleagues in this town who assume that it would be like elections in Russia or other countries. Well, it's actually not the case. Even uh, elections do take place in an uneven playing field, playing field. And so this criticism has often been made by European bodies, Venice Commission, uh, various uh, hum uh, you know, watchdogs. But at the end of the day, uh, on the day of election, elections do take place in a transparent environment and are counted in a way that uh, largely that may that Turks largely Turkish citizens largely feel to be accurate so that's also an important distinction man one of the cultural shocks for me in terms of Washington and the perception in Turkey uh, I want to get to Europe uh, quickly uh, yes, as Sinan has pointed out, and you have Alper pointed out, uh, there is a desire and a, and a, to rekindle relations with the West. But what does that mean? Because I don't know if we are talking about the same West. Return to the West is fine, and uh, there is an aspiration uh, that opposition parties seem to uh, express, and also uh, very clear that they equate that with uh, uh, more of a uh, return to uh, democratic framework or rule of law, but there isn't the same West. The world has moved on and we live in a chaotic geopolitical environment and what was on the table 10 years ago and 20 years ago, particularly from an EU accession membership perspective, is no longer on the table. So what does it mean, return to the West? And I, um, you know, um, 
I think that if the government was to change, if there was to be a change in government, this would be one of the big challenges. You know, if opposition parties actually won and sent a delegation to Europe, uh, and you know, here we are, where were we? Uh, I'm not sure what the answer will be from the EU. So that's one point. Uh, secondly, what is Europe doing about Turkish elections? I think they're watching and watching and sitting on the fence and waiting it out. They are muddling through, trying to avoid tension with the current government, also avoiding an embrace, a close photo op with the current government, and sort of waiting to see what six months, seven months, whenever the elections are, what will happen. It's very clear that they will decide and formulate a policy uh, for post-election policy, whether it's uh, with an Erdogan regime again or a post-Erdogan regime. Um, after the election results, but right now it's quiet. So that seems to be the European response and maybe Sinan also knows what, whether or not they are prepared to roll out a bigger plan for Turkey, but I doubt it. So it's a muddling through in many ways. Uh, and finally, I think I found this, I did mention the Syria part very interesting. And when I was reading this paper, I did also, uh, think about ways where uh, the current government uh, or the current president may have a path to victory because even though polling numbers do not mention that, he clearly does have that. And that really is also hidden in this paper. It's not necessarily in foreign policy, but the Syria section, if you were to read, the differences on Syria, essentially also talk about some of the differences the opposition uh, parties might have or might not have on the Kurdish issue. That's my timer to stop and, uh, uh, with my final Very sentence. Of you. And, uh, you know, uh, and so they are, as you have pointed out, uh, they talk about normalization, what should the Kurds do, Syrian Kurds, within a, a framework, within maybe to talk with the regime and all. But they're, they're clearly discussing that in the framework that the current government has structured, not deviating uh, from the, which begs the question of what would happen if Erdogan was to change course on this issue. In other words, if Erdogan was to have a more forward leaning on the Kurdish issue or moderate his tone, uh, it could be a very interesting electoral environment over the next few months in the run-up to the elections because it could really change some of these numbers since the Kurdish vote in Turkey is very sensitive to the policies towards Syria, Syrian regime, or the, uh, in general, uh, PYD issue. So those were some of the thoughts, but again, great work, and I recommend everyone to uh, read the uh, realist, this realist take and the conclusions at the end. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. That was, that was brilliant, and uh, you've raised a lot of important questions for me as well, and we can discuss those, including on you know, the question of what does it mean for Turkey to return to a Western vocation, and how receptive will that audience, the West, i.e., in that regard, so I think those are very important questions. Um, I have already um, followed Murphy's rule here and not done what I should have done. I was meant to give Sinan the floor because there's another aspect of our study uh, that we think is important and that, are, that has to do with the potential challenges, if there were political change, for the opposition to actually be able to implement the framework that uh, they have shared with us. But Sinan, with your indulgence, since I've already been uh, remiss in, in giving you the floor before Asta, let's go on to Humeira. Let's hear uh, her perspective. And then maybe having heard their specific thematic observations, you can wrap those up into your views in that regard. Humeira, uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Um, what I'd like to do with you uh, kindly, if you would indulge me, is to hear a little bit from you how you think this um, potential change in trajectory in Turkish foreign policy, first of all, would be viewed in Washington, D.C. Um, when, when the Biden administration uh, came into power, we saw an attempt, I think, on the part of President Erdogan and Turkey to see if, though they clearly rooted for Trump at the time, but once uh, the election results were obvious, there was an attempt to see if a cordial relationship could be built with the Biden administration. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's a relatively humble uh, 
um, embrace that the Biden administration has been giving, uh, giving uh, to uh, President Erdogan and to Turkey uh, in that regard. But then geopolitics came into play and other dimensions came into play. And of course, I'm also reminded of the fact that when the Biden administration came into power, one of the major slogans was rekindling uh, alliance relationships, rekindling the transatlantic partnership. Obviously, Turkey is an element of that, but um, we don't see it uh, among the leading interlocutors for the United States in many uh, issues that are pressing now in terms of international security. But should this trajectory actually transpire in Turkey, I'd be interested in hearing from you how that might have implications for the bilateral relationship. And maybe also interesting for all of us to hear, what do you think the, the policymakers in the United States will be looking to identify? What kinds of changes would they be looking to see? Thank you. Thanks, Alper, and thanks very much for having me. Um, and uh, just like Asla, I have a lot of praise for the work that you did, and I see that you did a little bit of journalistic work as well, going around, <laughs> asking people, talking. Um, so, But um, I want to make a couple of points um, in case what happens if a political change does really happen in, in Turkey, based on my reporting, based on my conversations with people in this town. I think... Um, there are going to be two main issues that uh, U.S. administrations, let's say Biden administration for now, because that's the administration we have, will be looking at. One is, what is the vision? What, is, what kind of a relationship does Turkey want to have with the rest of the world? That's, that's really defining, because if you look at some of the headlines over the past decade, but more recently over the past couple of years, there has been a lot of stories in foreign media with the adjectives of assertive, sometimes aggressive, combative. These have been very much associated with uh, Turkey's recent foreign policy. And in, I mean, perhaps like 10 years ago, the starting point was zero problems with neighbors, but we have all seen how that turned out. Now, there is an element of, of course, external factors in this. Like Oslo said, the world has changed. It has become even a more dangerous place, and Turkey had to change gears, so to say. Um, but I think they're going to be looking at what the opposition or the new leadership, if that's the case, wants to define itself when it comes to the rest of the world. And an extension, an immediate extension of that is like, how does Turkey see itself within NATO? Because that's a really important part of its identity. However, in this town, over the past several years, there has been an image increasingly that Turkey has not necessarily been a very stable and predictable and reliable NATO ally. Um, we have all seen at times these op-eds and various uh, articles about how Turkey should be kicked out of NATO and all that, and uh, the series of incidents that have basically triggered that. And I think the Biden administration had made a specific and deliberate effort <clears throat> when it first came to power to reassert that identity, to bring back Turkey within that NATO umbrella. I remember repetitive statements from the State Department, from senior members of the administration, starting their sentences, their statements, Turkey is a valued NATO ally, Turkey is a valued NATO partner. Um, that's, that's not a shorthand. That was very deliberate, and that was part of a message. So we, they're waiting to see, I think, how the opposition, if it wins, is going to position itself within NATO. And I think that's going to be very, um, very much linked to some of the recent events that we have seen since the start of the Ukraine war. Because the Ukraine war has presented opportunities, challenges, in the sense that we have seen um, an increasing trade between Russia and Turkey. And there has been a lot of questioning from the Western alliance on um, why that trade is booming, why there are so many meetings and phone calls between President Erdogan and uh, Russian President Putin. But there has been also some recognition that Turkey has been very instrumental when it comes to things like the grain deal, for example. Um, 
so I think how that is going to continue, whether or not it's going to continue, that's going to be really important. U.S. is already looking at clues to find some to find some signs and evidence on where the opposition might go in some of these issues. That's the bigger picture. And within that, I think a couple of themes really emerge, and the biggest one is the disagreement over Syria. There is a big distrust between the two countries um, over United States arming the YPG and the, the process that basically prompted the U.S. Uh, to partner with YPG in its fight against Islamic State. Um, so how, how will the new leadership is going to tackle that issue? The second one is going to be S-400s. Will, I mean, this issue is also frozen. It's very compartmentalized. Um, otherwise, I mean, the, the Biden administration has decided we cannot have uh, a different crisis with Turkey or any of our allies basically every single day. So it's clear that at the moment, with these circumstances, we are unable to solve this issue. So we will just park it here, freeze it, and we're going to try to focus on conducting diplomacy and work on a day-to-day -day basis. But if there would be a leadership change, certainly the S-400 issue is going to be on the table again. Um, and also, I would say, I would add that to Eastern Mediterranean as well. And I have picked these topics specifically because I think all of them have a very um, deep and strong nationalistic element to all of them. Um, I don't know if there are polls specifically asking Turkish citizens what they think about U.S. arming YPG and Syria policy or what they think how Turkey should uh, go forward in the eastern Mediterranean. But I think the anti-American sentiment has risen incredibly in Turkey over the past couple of years. And all of these issues, whomever would be in power, um, are shaped by that nationalistic narrative and that anti-American sentiment. So whoever is in power is probably have to going to navigate that. And I, I get the sense, based on my conversations, that Americans are very much aware of that. Um, yes, I'll leave it at that. Humana, thank you very much. You actually left it at a perfect spot to loop back into Sinan, because really that's a very important thing. The, the narrative that has been deployed in Turkey throughout the years that has really fed uh, an overwhelming skepticism towards the United States and towards the West at large is a very important constraint in terms of the foreign policy framework that the opposition has been talking about. In other words, rejuvenating Turkey's vocation in the West. Employing policies to that end obviously will be more challenging in such a an environment and such a, uh, when the society has that type of a perception. And Sinan, uh, w again with apologies for uh, being remiss in the beginning, may I turn to you to also speak about this constraint, but other elements that uh, I know you want to talk about from our report that uh, will have implications on the ability of the opposition to implement this foreign policy framework. And then we will turn to you and to our uh, audience uh, that is following virtually for questions. We already have some questions coming in. I encourage, them, I encourage our participants to continue sending them in and also all of you to think of questions you may have. Sinan, please. Thank you. Well, first of all, Humeira, really many thanks for your kind words about the report. Um, Humeira said something that we had done some journalistic work as well as part of this. But of course, we're think tankers. We're not journalists. And therefore, what we try to do is also to have, you know, in addition to doing that direct interviews and compiling what we heard from, you know, our interlocutors, which is the journalistic part, we also brought some skepticism because what we need to do is really give a good sense of how this is going to impact policy real world policy and therefore you know we, we 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 basically had to think with alper about what is the connect or the disconnect 
between what we hear from interlocutors and their ability to implement this in practice. And here we did bring up some questions, which is why we went a bit you know, further than journalism, which is a true accounting of you know, what you hear from people. Uh, and there, there are a number of you know, difficulties. They, these are not you know, totally insurmountable difficulties. But nonetheless, we wanted to enumerate those difficulties with a view to fully understand whether what we hear from them will actually be transposable and transposed in policy terms. One difficulty is we don't know who the candidate is. We don't know who's going to run. I mean, again, under the assumption of political change, if Erdogan wins, then we know. But if the opposition wins, which is you know, the more perhaps uh, in, in this, you know, the, the, the direction that we took to understand the impact of an opposition win, whether it happens or not, the first imponderable is you know, we don't even know who the candidate is. And the candidate, under the current constitutional system, has enormous influence. Uh, and therefore, what we heard from our different interlocutors, to what extent that will also reflect the agenda of the co candidate, is the first question. The second question is, the governance is going to be much more complicated and more friction prone compared to today. Uh, you know, today, the, you know, the sort of criticism has been that it's been you know, a hyper-centralized system, lacks and checks and balances. But nonetheless, the line of you know, the hierarchy and the line of thinking is very clear. If an opposition, you know, under the assumption of an opposition wins, those lines will be less clear. Because you're going to have one candidate uh, that could be part of one political family. Then you're going to have a cabinet that will be representative of an internal coalition. Right now, there are six parties sitting around the table trying to strategize. Uh, and so the, you know, the lines will not be as clear as today. On top of that, on top of that, there is the issue about the relationship between the executive uh, and the legislative arm of government. Because today, that's not a problem. You know, the, uh, the executive has the majority in parliament, along with its um, you know, uh, coalition partner, the MHP. But under the scenario of a coalition win, or uh, win by the opposition, that may not necessarily be the case. We don't know how the arithmetic in Parliament will, you know, will eventually come out. And therefore, the relationship between Parliament and executive branch may be much more complicated. We may even end up with a scenario where you know, the, ruling, the new ruling coalition may not have a majority in Parliament. So they may rely on HDP, for instance, uh, to get support in Parliament. That's also a possibility under current circumstances. So there are all these complications uh, that, you know, that you know, we'll, we'll have to think about in terms of when we try to understand whether what we hear from these foreign policy spokespeople will actually be transposed into, uh, into policy. And then the last two, uh, really, is that Compared to Erdogan, who has uh, had you know, vast experience in foreign policy as the head of state and before as the prime minister of the country, the two main parties of the opposition, uh, the leadership, has actually little experience in foreign policy. There are smaller parties like Deva, Ali Babajan, and Gelecek, Ahmet Davutoglu, who have been you know, foreign ministers under um, AK Party governments. So they have experience. But the two large parties, CHP and E Party, the leadership, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu and Meral Akşener, don't really have experience in foreign policy. So how their, their worldview is going to impact ultimate foreign policy making? Because in the eventual setup of an opposition win, these two parties will have much bigger say. It's a bit like animal farm. Everybody's equal, but some, you know, some animals are more equal. Uh, so that's going to depend on you know, the popular vote that they get. And today, these are the two leading parties of the opposition. Uh, so this is really, you know, in order to, uh, we're throwing out all these issues, because you know, trying to extrapolate 
from what we've discovered, discussed, analyzed, commented, to actual real world policy has these you know, number of difficulties. And we wanted to be obviously transparent about what we saw. So we you know, basically uh, summarized uh, our, uh, our interactions and our dialogues. But ultimately, you have to think about these difficulties uh, in, in, in when you think about real world policy a paradigm that will be uh, surfacing under a scenario of uh, political change in Turkey. And really, uh, the, I, I also want to uh, further underline what Humeira has also said, uh, that uh, even if there is political change, uh, what you know, these type of teams and initiatives will, will have to be implemented with a public opinion that for two decades has been exposed to a different worldview. Uh, and that necessarily will create some tension and some friction as they try to navigate these, you know, these differences. And that might be a, a further hindrance. Sinan, thank you. Um, you. <laughs> thank you very much. I think the way in which Sinan's presented the, the potential constraints of this policy, this foreign policy agenda or framework being implemented on the part of the uh, opposition infuses a, a significant degree of realism uh, also into the debate. And I think that's, uh, that's extremely essential. I have a number of questions here that I'm going to turn to. But uh, with everyone's intelligence, I'm going to use the prerogative of the seat. Uh, that's a tradition I've uh, come to notice in the think tank world as uh, someone who's a relative newcomer. And I will abuse that authority as well and ask three short questions to our discussants. And then I will turn to our uh, participants here and uh, to the online questions. Asla, uh, in order, I want to pose some short questions, if I may. One to you. If you were, we're in a fictional scenario here, aren't we? So I have the liberty of um, pushing the limits there. If you were advising the political opposition, if there were political change, this notion of returning to the West that we talked about, what would be three main themes that you think you would advise as foreign policy areas or domestic? That could be relevant, obviously, as well and interlinked. Um, that would help further that cause if it were the cause of the, um, the, um, an incoming potential administration in Turkey. And with your indulgence, I'll just pose the questions and then, and then leave it to all of you. Sinan, I think something on everyone's mind might be related to time frames. What kind of time frames are we talking about in terms of when the elections will happen, when the candidate needs to be announced? If you can shed a little bit more light on the deadlines, if you will, as to when we might expect more concrete elements of the opposition's approach, the names, the, uh, the candidates will need to materialize. Um, and also, maybe um, if uh, there is a, a coherence that you see, uh, or an incoherence that you see among them right now in terms of moving this agenda or framework uh, forward. And uh, Humeira, uh, I think the toughest question is to you. That comes to my mind, if you don't mind. You mentioned a couple of items that obviously will be very important in terms of um, the, the focus that Washington, D.C. will have if there were change in Turkey. <clears throat> you spoke about Syria, the YPG, the S-400, the Eastern Med, and um, the notion of skepticism towards the United States. Um, is there thinking going on in Washington, D.C. as to how they, how the United States, may facilitate solving these problems? Is the posture in D.C., these are all problems that have come to uh, materialize at Turkey's behest? Hence, it falls upon Turkey. Or is there a bit more intellectual and considered thinking going on in the sense that there might be some things that the United States may do in terms of posturing or other policy decisions that may facilitate this process uh, if, at the end of the day, it's about finding mutual ground uh, and mutual interests? So I'll leave those questions with you. Asli, can we start with you, please? Um, I thought. I've been thinking while well, you were asking. That the was other the idea, because uh, I dropped that one on so, you. So, <laughs> um, if I had to, if I were, uh, if I were the foreign minister of Turkey, I would start uh, with. Uh, obviously, there's no chance, but since you ask what the 
priority of the next, if there was a transition of power, I would not start with the West. I would start with the neighborhood. And, uh, and go back to very simply zero problems with neighbors. Uh, the government started normalization with some of uh, regional rivals like Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE and Israel and so on. But really what is needed is the immediate periphery of Turkey and a policy of stability, good neighborly relations with countries and people that are living in Turkey's immediate neighborhood. That would be my priority because you know, that in itself would significantly change uh, and open up other avenues for Turkey. And Greece is very important in this, of course. Important for, in terms of uh, reduction of escalation and issues within NATO, but also important for opening the EU pathways. Uh, it has to be that, uh, it used to be that, you know, I remember in a, a trip by Erdogan in 2010, that I covered and uh, you know he went and said we have to have a win-win scenario here and you know why are we spending all this money and fighter jets and I mean, you know and, and, and doing dogfights and all Turkey and Greece have to go back to that win-win situation and uh, essentially both sides are right now uh, thinking I mean the, the paradigm is significantly changed in Greece they see isolation of Turkey as a net strategic benefit. I think they're wrong. It's a, it's, it's a strategic threat for, Tur for Greece, for Turkey to be isolated. So I would spend time on that relationship. Um, you know, this is not to say it's one party or one country or the other that's responsible for the current deterioration, but the current deterioration is costing both sides, and particularly Turkey, a lot in terms of its relations with the West. And then, uh, you know, move forward with perhaps offering to open accession uh, chapters on justice and rule of uh, justice and uh, rule of law reform to the EU. Not making huge demands, but saying let's open this chapter. That would be my first uh, hundred days in. So the argument is the first, first hundred days in government. Sorry, sometimes going back to basics makes sense. Yeah. And even if it may not entail solving the problems with Greece, for example, that was the example you cited, the tone and the modalities in which that challenge is being managed, I think, is what you're alluding I to. You know better than me that solving the problems with Greece on a legal basis is nearly impossible. It's very difficult and cannot be done easily because of competing claims. But creating a good atmosphere is possible, and that really takes a will on both sides um, more than anything else. Having served in Greece as a Turkish diplomat, I continue to be optimistic against all odds that when there's a will, there should be a way. So uh, I won't be that pessimistic about solving those problems. But thank you. Sinan, can I turn to you? Yeah, uh, very briefly. Um, at the latest, the elections will need to happen in June 2023. But there's a possibility uh, that we may end up with early elections. The move to date is, you know, uh, end May. So it's, you know, it's basically a month uh, early. But if you take May as a reference, that means that on the opposition side, the candidate must really be announced at the latest by February. So January, February would be the time when I'd say the, the opposition would need to decide on who is it that is going to run uh, on, on their side in this race. Then there is another important you know, development that goes <coughs> in parallel, which is that independently of who the candidate shall be, there is now ongoing work in that table of six where you see the opposition parties have gathered to work in order to, and to prepare a common sort of coalition protocol. That will be the, you know, the government program for the incoming government if they win the elections. And there the idea is to have this ready and launched by the end of this year. And that program will have a domestic policy component, what they intend to do or what they've agreed to do as the table of six on democratic reforms, fundamental freedoms. It will have a foreign policy component. It will have an economic policy component, uh, 
uh, and other main uh, categories of policy. So that document is going to come out in all likelihood before the announcement of uh, a, a joint candidate on the side of the opposition. And therefore, we're very happy sitting here that it was almost a race against time that we were able to do this and launch our own product before you know, the official document on the, on the opposition side, which is likely to be much less detailed than what we did because ultimately it's going to be about, you know, they can't write as extensively as, as we have, but in broad strokes, it's going to give a sense of where they want to go if they get elected. Uh, so um, I think uh, these inter interesting developments are in the pipeline. Tina, thank you. That's, that's very useful in terms of understanding the mechanics behind the process that is ahead of us. Humaira, I hope I didn't put you on the spot with that question, but my intention there was through you to try and understand the mindset that is prevailing here and how that might link into this um, potential scenario of change in Turkey. So to the extent that you can shed light on that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, Alper. I mean, if you're asking whether there is like a, a big sort of a busy preparation uh, within the corridors of DC, State Department, Pentagon for the new Turkey leadership and like a look back of like, oh, we've made mistakes, we will have to, you know, change these. That's, that's not the case, for sure. However, I think uh, the answer to your question is yes, a little. And um, I think, I do think that there is a, an, an Erdogan-focused look. And I think it's most evident in Congress. Um, there, it's, a, it's a big barrier, um, I think, in how they view Turkey. So if there would be a new leadership and there is a new leader from the Congress, I suspect there is going to be an immediate shift in the tone, perhaps, mm -hmm. with the expectation that this new leader is not automatically adopt some of the rhetoric that was coming from President Erdogan. And why would that happen? that may happen or we might hear similar rhetoric because of the anti-American sentiment that we've talked about because of the growing nationalistic sentiment across <laughs> Turkey. But if that is not going to be the case, I do feel that the Congress uh, would be much more open to change. Now, I have not picked up signs within this administration of uh, some sort of a soul searching when it comes to their policy in Syria. Um, but that is not because, you know, they don't care or the overall foreign policy of the Biden administration has been very much focused on Asia. And they've, they've made that very, very clear. Their priority is Asia. Um, that's where they see the biggest challenge. So it's a little bit of, it's a bit of an issue of a bandwidth, really. Mm -hmm. And then came the Ukraine war and that basically consumes a lot of the oxygen in, in this town. So there has been some policy reviews when it, when it comes to Syria policy. Um, I mean, experts who are following Syria day in, day out, I know for a fact that some of them are quite disappointed with what came out of the review because it effectively affirmed that it's status quo. They, I have not seen any willingness in, with the Biden administration to make any changes when it comes to Syria policy. And the Syria policy at the moment is continue to support SDF, YPG in Syria and continue to fight against Islamic State and continue with the aid work in northwestern Syria whenever you can. Um, however, I do know that there has been some disagreement with the Obama administration, because this was a decision that was made in May 2017, if I remember correctly, which is Trump administration. However, the groundwork has been laid during the Obama administration. And there has been some people who didn't necessarily think that it was, it was a good idea to go this way. However, I mean, we can go back to that time. We've done a lot of reporting as well. Um, there were a lot of suspicions around 
the, the partners that Turkey was suggesting, and then this decision has been taken. So there isn't a big soul searching in terms of like we've made major mistakes, we would have to change course. Um, but I do think there is a willingness to uh, change, to make some amendments, changes. Um, I think they're going to be looking at a lot to Turkey, to the new leadership, if it happens, um, how willing they are to make some of the changes to perhaps sh have like a bit of a shift in the tone. Um, and I th think they're going to be open uh, to sitting down and talking about certain things. And S-400 is another one. There has been um, several potential solutions discussed privately. Some of them we have reported, other media have reported. However, none of them solved this. And now this is an NDAA um, and it's law and um, it is very, very clearly defined. I don't think that that means um, it cannot be solved. I don't think that that means parties cannot move on anything. Um, I, I do get the sense that there might be a willingness on the American side as well to move to solve this issue if there would be a new leadership. And again, depending on what that new leadership's tone, rhetoric, and approach is. I hope that sums it up. Can I ask a Austin, question please. to Himeira? What would a deal under the current government look like on S-400? Would. would a deal under a cover, what would a deal look like? On I, this government or uh, the next government, what would it look like? An S-400 deal. A deal meaning that, that uh, makes this issue go away as, a, as an irritant in the bilateral relationship. Well, I mean, we've all read about some of the potential uh, solutions, uh, which basically didn't work with Turkish government's position. But, I mean, before entertaining that, I really would like to say that I, I'm, I'm not sure they're actively looking at mm -hmm. trying to solve this. Um, because there, there has been, there were a lot of conversations around this that, ex that extended from July 2019 when Turkey has made the acquisition and the S-400 physically arrived Turkey to the point where Trump administration um, during its lame that period sanctioned Turkey. That's a very long time trying to find a solution for this. And there has been all sorts of uh, suggestions uh, do not uh, do not use it, which is basically what's been happening right now, but bury it to the ground, sell it to another country. Um, and again, we've mentioned in our reporting, this came up recently, again, earlier this year, uh, during a visit, I believe, first by Deputy Secretary Wendy Sherman. Uh, we have reported that, and this was floated as an idea that perhaps Turkey would like to give the S-400 to Ukraine, uh, which was very, uh, very quickly shut down and wasn't even uh, entertained. So the answer is, um, I don't know right now, because a lot of these ideas have been entertained, have been shut down. The NDAA language is very, very clear. Would there be willingness to try to make a change in the law, to make it to give the parties a little bit more room to discuss this, perhaps there could be. Um, but again, it's going, to, it's going to depend on what the new leadership, uh, what kind of a tone, what kind of an approach they would bring, I think. Mira, yeah, thank you. You have another question? Go ahead. No, I no? think Conair. <laughs> thank you for allowing us to tap into your wisdom, into your journalistic insight. That was very valuable. I want to turn to our audience. I have some questions here. I will also take those. Let's start with the gentleman right here, please. If you could kindly introduce yourself, please. Certainly. Um, my name is Ian McGilvery. I'm an analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, uh, Washington, D.C. office. I'm also a scholar of Turkish foreign policy, so it's really good to see you all today. Um, I just want to say thank you for your insights um, into this great paper. I just wanted to, obviously, one of the key things that come from it is this kind of reinstitutionalization of foreign policy. Um, and obviously, the question, I want to ask is obviously moving beyond just this uh, rebalancing between the executive and legislative, but more about the bureaucracy. 
Uh, there's obviously been a lot of kind of ref reformation, particularly since the July 15th coup attempt uh, within the TSK, within the foreign ministry. Did any of the, po you know, this deinstitutionalization that's kind of occurred over even the last six to even longer, was there any plan by the opposition in your discussions about how they're going to tackle the larger kind of state reformation processes that have been underway or even the longer social transformation that's been underway? Was there any kind of indication what would happen in the kind of bureau, the capacity to engage in these different foreign policies? Sinan, may I direct that question to you? But I want to couple that with another question that we have online. Let's, yeah, collect a few That questions. is related. Because we are. Let me read that question right away, if you don't mind. That has come online because I think it's uh, linked to this. The question is, does the reinstitutionalization of foreign policy and the transfer of gravity from Aksaray, meaning the uh, ruling party, to the MFA, the foreign ministry, mean less securitization and hard policy in exercising foreign policy, or the prevalent illusions, the grandeur of Turkey as a global power will continue with a more nationalistic, pro-Kemalist government. So if you could just bear that in mind as well. I can take a couple more questions. Sona, please. Thank you, great panel. Uh, really enjoy the conversation and also excellent paper. As I can imagine it took so much work uh, and congrats on getting it out before uh, the platform got their paper out. Uh, the paper has some really nice, interesting takeaways. I agree that uh, the tenor of Turkish EU ties will change. And of course, markets would rally. That's economic relief. Uh, similarly, I think in the US, you could see the Congress uh, showing willingness to lift some of the sanctions on Turkey. So the question Asla asked, I actually have it to you guys. What was your sense of how far the opposition is willing to go regarding the S-400 issue? You know, would they give it up? Would they open it to U.S. eavesdropping? Or would they continue with status quo? That's the glasses half full question. The glasses half empty question is, uh, you know, given the differences in opposition parties' views and that this is going to be split government, uh, but also maybe, um, you know, a minority government, uh, you know, of the issues you have flagged, PYD, Syria, East Med, others, where would you anticipate the first crisis point in foreign policy in terms of uh, government cohesion? Thank you, Sonar. The gentleman in the red sweater had a question. Uh, hello, thank you very much for an interesting panel. My name is George. I am from the Republic of Georgia. Uh, I'm interested uh, in case of political change in Turkey. Uh, what do you think about Turkey's policy towards South Caucasus uh, region? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, maybe we can start with uh, these questions. Sinai, can I turn to you first to address the questions on reinstitutionalization of foreign policy and implications? Yeah, let me try to uh, answer that. Um, when we talk to our counterparts, the way that they have formulated this challenge was to say that recently, especially after the constitutional change, uh, 2017, the presidency 2018, that the uh, foreign policy making has really shifted to the presidential palace with very little input from the, from the foreign ministry. Um, and therefore, this was not you know, the type of uh, decision making uh, mechanic mechanics that they want to continue. And that they, what they want to redress this situation, being still aware that until the time when there is a politically opportune moment for constitutional change, which they've promised that you know, they want to switch to a parliamentary system, they say a strengthened parliamentary system, until that time, they will need to operate under the current constitution which means that you know, the, 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 the presidency, uh, the centralized presidential system will remain. However, you know, we haven't discussed really on, uh, about the human resources side. It's more about you know, the institutional relationship between the presidency and the foreign ministry. But this is not just, uh, if you want, a, a, in a way, if you want to enlarge this, this is what they say they are going to practice if they come to power as a blueprint. So it's not just about the foreign ministry. It's also about the Ministry of Agriculture. It's about the Ministry of Energy. So the decision making will need to be much more balanced in all these policy areas. 
by emboldening and empowering the line ministries the way that it had been before the transition to a presidential system. So in a way, they are going to operate in a virtual parliamentary system to some extent by empowering the ministries. Uh, of course, the, presid the, presidential, you know, the presidential office will still have some you know, considerable uh, power of initiative and decision. But nonetheless, the balance will, will need to be redressed. Um, and again, here inserting a, a shred of skepticism is ultimately this will also depend on you know, whether you know, the opposition candidate, assuming that he or she wins the elections, whether that person will actually play the game the way that they're advertising now. That's also an open question because we don't know who that person shall be at this point in time. Uh, so that's, you know, I hope I've answered your question to some extent. Now, regarding the question that we received from the floor, I would say that, yes, we would expect to see a diffusion uh, of this more, you know, nationalistic uh, policy, essentially because, again, you know, if you listen to them, what they promise is that they want to reestablish a sound balance between domestic and foreign. And their criticism has been, as I, as I tried to highlight previously, that uh, since the transition to a presidential system, domestic political considerations have had an, you know, uh, a, um, a very heavy impact on foreign policy making. So therefore, if you take that as a, you know, as a basis of what the foreign policy um, paradigm is likely to be, then yes, you can say that Turkey will end up with a more predictable, more mature foreign policy, not so much shifting on any of the areas that Alper has mentioned that are seen as national causes. But nonetheless, we might go back to a, a tradition of, you know, uh, that of, of more, you know, perhaps uh, more, you know, more balanced, uh, more mature policy making, which will be more predictable um, and with less influence for, uh, from domestic pressures. Always, you will always have a degree of influence from domestic political considerations. That's the nature of democracy. But nonetheless, a new and more productive balance uh, can actually be, um, uh, be achieved uh, if, you know, if the thinking goes in that direction. I just want to tag on to that a little bit. I'm sitting in the comfort zone of acting as the, the moderator, but since I've also contributed to yes, the document, should, let me, should, yeah, let me yeah. tap into that. I feel a little bit of responsibility here. You know, one element that we've seen from all of, the, uh, of our interlocutors is they've made the point that besides the fact that they believe the conduct of foreign policy needs to be put more in an institutional framework, as used to be the case, and Sinan defined that as the line ministry is taking a more leading role, as was the case in the past. That obviously translates into a certain filtered system of, if you will, of policy making. And that's what is missing right now. And you see the implications of that, and they identify these. I'm speaking uh, on the basis of what we've heard from uh, the opposition. They identify certain areas and certain practices which they believe have been detrimental to both the conduct of Turkish foreign policy, but even to reaching the stated goals of those policies. And some of the elements that they identify is, for example, um, sectarian-based politics or the practice of being more involved in the domestic affairs of other countries. Now, when you have line ministries and relevant agencies that can perform the normal functions, as used to be the case in the past, there will be an inherent, if you will, filtering process in which it will be less possible to take these maybe seemingly <clears throat> um, aspirational, but actually when you think of the long-term strategic implications, uh, detrimental policies. So a shift of that nature uh, may produce, according to the views of the opposition, uh, a built-in, if you will, safeguard against abrupt decisions of that uh, nature. Um, we have about 15, 17 minutes left. I want to get to some of our other questions. So now you asked uh, a question about the S-400. I want to I talk a little bit about that. Uh, it was quite um, um, clear uh, and very uniform uh, that 
all of the opposition parties, without exception, that we were able to talk to, identified the acquisition of the S-400 as being a mistake and something that needs to be remedied. So it was quite clear that should there be change, and as you mentioned it, that's where the glass might, glass may, might be helpful. Should there be change, that might be an area where um, the progress could be uh, possible. Of course, it will very much also depend on what they will see in terms of the body language that will come out of the United States, both in terms of addressing that challenge, but also in other areas that are uh, priority issues uh, for any potential incoming government in Turkey. Now, the crisis point is, you know, we're talking around so many variables here. What would be the first major crisis point, that was Sonar's question, if there were to be political change in Turkey in the foreign policy realm? I believe that was the question. And uh, if we take Çetiriz Perus, these conditions as they are uh, today and assume that's the environment that they're functioning in, I think that will also depend on the nature and composition of the government, of course the leadership, individuals and so on, uh, but for example, should that be a coalition government that needs the support of the HDP, then that will obviously have implications on to what extent uh, the government may be willing or be able to uh, keep a distance from engaging the PYD or to what extent it may be willing uh, to do so. So I think, again, when you look at the challenges, both in terms of the security dimension, uh, but also in terms of its implications for Turkey's relations with the United States and many other countries, but also the, the potent nature of Syrian refugees has taken in the domestic scene in Turkey, I would assume that Syria-related matters will be probably the most potent area where potentially there may be disagreements among uh, these uh, political actors. Uh, that would be my quick answer to that uh, question. Um, Asli Humeira, if you have anything Can to I add on this, please. Can I quickly add uh, an interesting component of this, uh, and Sonar, you know this from following Turkish politics day to day, is, but it struck me nonetheless when I read the paper that nearly all opposition parties on paper are saying on the record that they have issues with the government policy of working with the Syrian armed opposition. Uh, and I thought that was important that day. There's clear desire for a change in Syria policy. In terms of how they'll deal with Syrian Kurds, there's differences, nuances between E party and uh, CHP. And that could obviously uh, uh, be an issue not just after the elections, in the run-up to the elections, I think, particularly if the government decides to moderate their tone, that nuance will become more of an issue moving forward for the opposition. Uh, but I think we had a question on South Caucasus. Let's not miss our colleague has left. The gentleman has left. Would you be able to hold on that? So yeah, sure. uh, we're assuming he'll be, come, he'll be coming back. Um, but we do have other questions. If there are, please go ahead. The microphone is coming. So I'm not a super expert on um, Turkish foreign policy, as you all are. But I'm curious as to the centralization of the presidency and how that is affecting foreign policy. And you were talking earlier about how they want to re organize a parliamentary system, and will that um, solve the issues that they're seeing right now with the centralization of the presidency, or does there need to be a bigger structural change or a change within the opposition party and who exactly will be in charge? Thank you for that question. Every question is a good question, so we welcome that as well. Thank you. Sinan, I'm going to turn to you on that. You've addressed it mostly, but maybe you can address different aspects of it, but there's another question that came from the floor that I'd like to add to that. Legally speaking, can Erdogan, uh, President Erdogan, still run for another term if elections take place in June, or would they de facto need to be called earlier? If you can address those two. Humeira, whenever you want to step in, please feel free to do so on any topic. Uh, starting with the second one, um, whether uh, President Erdogan can run, ultimately the arbiter of that question will need to be the high electoral board. Because if the elections took, take place in their announced time frame, then the opposition will claim in all likelihood that Erdogan cannot run. 
because he's been the president of the country two, already two, with two mandates, and the Constitution says that, you know, that's the limit. However, you know, then, you know, the, uh, ultimately the high electoral board may interpret it another way and say that, you know, he was president under the previous Constitution, so that doesn't count. Under the current Constitution, he only had a mandate and he can run. So we don't know, you know, how that, how that decision will come about. But I suspect the opposition will not want to get into that sort of legalistic uh, struggle. And that's the reason why we may end up with anticipated elections uh, one month before, because that constitutionally allows President Erdogan to run uh, for a third term, uh, because in, in, under those circumstances, uh, Parliament uh, will have uh, passed a bill for early elections, and that allows uh, you know, for a third mandate constitutionally. So I think that's where we're going to end up. Can I just jump in of on course, this whole please. issue of uh, returning to the parliamentary system and centralization of presidency? I think the opposition has a real um, conundrum because while they say they want to return to parliamentary politics and they're running on that platform, it's nearly impossible. Uh, I say that, of course, it's not possible to, they could just say, bring back the old books and wherever. But that puts them in the same spot that this government found them on some of the issues and uh, in terms of uh, decision making and ministries and whatnot. So in all likelihood, a return to parliamentary system will effectively mean something different than what Turkey had before not as centralized as the current system, but also not so decentralized that it paralyzes a coalition government. So maybe a semi-presidential system. Also in terms of voter opinions, what I am sensing, and this is uh, uh, an entirely unscientific uh, view, but what I'm sensing from people is that parliamentary Parliament, return to parliamentary system isn't what excites opposition voters. It's other things. It's the economy. It's, it, it, it's sort of uh, foreign policy in some instances. Uh, or it's feelings about Erdogan. You like him or you don't like him. But it's not that they, we, we want to go back to a system where there is a lot of you know, process in making decisions. And it would eventually be a trap for the opposition too. In order to make the changes they want, they do need this system in some fashion or a diluted form of this system. Also, you thank you. the question on the Caucasus. Now. You can turn to the South Caucasus, the gentleman is back. We were waiting for you. I leave that to you. <laughs> you Please, you kick off and I will well, kick in. I'll just, I think uh, you are in a better place to talk about Georgia. I will just say in general about the Caucasus, I think it's very important now that Russia is fully uh, occupied and engaged in, in Ukraine, there is, uh, there is a space for regional countries to establish uh, greater cooperation and form an economic bloc. I, you know, part of that is obviously Armenian-Turkish normalization, which needs to happen, needs, and obviously Armenian... Uh, Azeri peace, but with Georgia also in the mix, a four-way uh, regional uh, free trade agreement and economic cooperation would go a long way in terms of stabilizing Caucasus. Turkey treads on this space very gingerly when it comes to Georgia because it doesn't want to irritate Russia for obvious reasons, but economy is an important uh, area where uh, building a regional uh, cooperation and building it uh, uh, for, you know, in a way that we couldn't imagine before would be very important and mutually beneficial. Just one sentence, and then I'm going to turn to Humayra Sinan, I think, is, is uh, conveying a question there. You know, Georgia obviously is a very critical linchpin in the Southern Caucasus as far as Turkey is concerned. Um, that will continue. There's no doubt about it. The same holds true for Azerbaijan. And the missing link has been Armenia, obviously. 
And I also personally believe, and this is something that we didn't dwell upon that much in our engagement with the opposition uh, party representatives, but when you look at statements and the atmosphere in Turkey on this issue, and also what's going on in the Southern Caucasus, particularly between Armenia and Azerbaijan, despite all the obvious challenges and their implications for Georgia, that is why I'm broadening the picture, I think this is, despite all the challenges, an opportune moment in time to uh, chart a path for a better future for the region, and I see that probability still there. Please, Sinan, for him. Can that. I step in your shoes? Yes, for, please for, do. For a moment. Please do. Because I have a, you know, I want to field a question that we received uh, to Humeira, and actually two to you, Alper. Oh, that's the you trick. Get, you know, uh, <laughs> sitting there quietly. Lots of role yeah. reversals yeah. here. <laughs> role reversal towards the end, yes. <laughs> We'd like to score the last goal on the 19th minute. Uh, <laughs> Humeira, the question that we got for you is, uh, why is America so important to Turkey? That's an amazing question. Isn't that's, it? That's yes. a million dollar question. <laughs> so let me try to answer that with my personal experience. I covered the State Department, which means um, I wake up and I see my inbox has exploded with emails from all around our Reuters bureaus all around the world, and they're asking for U.S. comment on anything that happened in their country. And it's all around the place. Something has happened in Iraq, in uh, Malaysia, in Turkey, somewhere in Latin America. Um, somebody has been elected. Someone has been detained. A human rights activist uh, has, uh, has been jailed. And People want to know, what does the United States think? It is still the most consequential or one of the most consequential countries in the world in an undeniable way. Um, it is the biggest economy in the world. The second biggest economy, China, um, cares a lot about its relationship with the United States. Um, so, and, but, but I mean... That is like the bigger, that is the bigger picture answer. When it comes to Turkey, Turkey is a NATO ally. U.S. is the de facto leader of the NATO alliance, but also Turkey is still very much dependent for its military needs to United States, even though it has made quite a lot of progress in terms of developing its own uh, defense industry. Um, so I think that relationship, that that, that perception is still going to continue. But I do want to say this. As I cover this throughout the years, and I was in the Middle East before, I was in the receiving end of U.S. policies, per se, and now I'm in Washington, I do see the diminishing impact of the American world. The U.S. sanctions, for example perhaps were widely feared before. Now there are a lot of countries in the world who do get around U.S. sanctions, and U.S. is unable to change behavior in the way that it wants with those sanctions. And obviously, the, another reason for, for the bigger picture is like U.S. is basically the owner of the dollar. So like that, that is extremely important, and nobody wants to be outside that financial uh, that financial system, basically. But especially during the Trump administration, uh, because of the more unilateral approach that was taken in, in foreign policy, I think a lot of regions in the world, Middle East being one, uh, felt that, okay, we, we have to look elsewhere um, because U.S. is not necessarily prioritizing us. So we have to be prioritizing other relationships with different, different parts of the world. And I think Biden administration is now feeling the impact of all of this. When you look at the administration's relations with Saudi Arabia, even Israel, when it comes to um, rallying allies with the Ukraine war, and they did do a fairly good job. Um, I don't know if it answers that particular question. It is still one of the most consequential, powerful countries in the world and specific to, to, to the U.S., uh, to, to Turkey. Um, it has been one of its uh, longest standing allies. Um, I just want to close this loop by saying this, though. Um, 
there is there is a bit of a struggle right now for the global rules-based order that we're all witnessing, I think. I traveled with Secretary Blinken uh, to Asia, and then we came back to Anchorage in March 2021, and we have witnessed this incredible uh, meltdown between the U.S. delegation and the Chinese delegation in Alaska at the beginning of their first meeting uh, with the Biden administration. And it was very interesting to witness because I saw the Chinese foreign minister pointing his finger at Secretary Blinken, and this was in response to what they perceived as the U.S. trying to preach them how to, how to conduct their foreign policy and what they see are the world principles and values. And they were openly pushing back against that and standing up to that. Um, so I think because of all of these reasons, U.S. is still very, very important to Turkey, and I think it's going to continue to be very important to Turkey. But it's, in a way, there are parts where its weight is diminishing, and that is going to inevitably have an impact on Turkey and other countries to look for, for alternatives and to flourish its relations with other countries that that, that it can seek partnerships with. Thank you. I thought I'll turn the tables on you. This will have to be an overtime goal. Yes, and yeah, we're just about, you know, uh, reaching the end of our allocated time, as they say. But there are two questions where I think, you know, you need to answer. One is, has the opposition provided any stances on Cyprus Greece's men? And two is, do you believe the Turkish government will hold off on confirming Finland and Sweden into NATO until after the election? Okay, very quickly, since we're late. In, um, on Finland and NATO, the verdict is out. It's difficult to say. Um, but my bet is that the value of holding out on Finland and Sweden, as quote-unquote legitimate as Turkey's expectations, particularly from Sweden maybe in that context, the value of it, is more the implications on the domestic scene, particularly going into elections for Erdogan and the AK Party. And that value can be um, instrumentalized only before the elections. So my bet would be that if Turkey uh, were to receive some concrete developments in this regard from Sweden, that would be enough for Erdogan to be able to turn to the population and say, here it is, they've healed. And We've gotten this result. Uh, my bet would be that it'll be before the elections are over. As far as relations uh, or the you know the situation in Cyprus, Greece, and the Eastern Mediterranean is concerned, I, I tried to briefly allude to that. These are sort of so to speak national causes in Turkey, almost above politics, long long-standing problems. So the basic thrust of Turkish foreign policy and approaches in these areas are not expected to be any different under the political opposition. It's clear from the answers they give us in this regard. Yet, the posturing, the non-confrontational approach in which they envisage addressing or trying to address these problems, uh, that, that is in line with how Asa was describing what needs to be done. That is, you may not be able to solve the problems, but the way in which you try and manage them can be different. I think that's where we will find ourselves should there be political change. And with that, I'll turn it over to you so you can do the closing, Sina. <laughs> Well, this is the part where we, uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking you know, our, our panel uh, for today. So many thanks uh, for being with us, uh, Asla Humeira. Uh, I hope it was an interesting discussion uh, for you uh, who came uh, to Carnegie Endowment and for all those who watched us in different corners of the world. Many thanks for that, uh, really, uh, and watch the space. Thank you. <laughs>